the house, but like his side place. His side place. That he records into. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Andy. How are you? Hello, folks. Hello. We're talking shit about Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> what? Not just Go Kevin. Go for it. Everybody. Bring it on. Yeah. Julian, what are you talking shit about today? I mean, uh, Riverside's no hand feature. Riverside's no hand feature. The fact that Opal doesn't work with everything, even though I quite like it. Because Kevin, Kevin seduces me every week by saying, um, oh, you look so good with this camera. I'm like, oh, let me try again every week. You do. Uh, it looks a lot better. When, when so there's a lot around. of stuff that's going on in the world at the moment. I, several, this company that we were talking about last week that Bill Gurley is on the board of, uh, Good Egg, is that the name of the company? Good Eggs. Yeah, Good Eggs. Which uh, and a bunch of other companies are doing these uh, crown down rounds. One of them recently I saw that wiped out Sequoia. I forget the separate company. So it's like it's it's this wild world that's happening right now. And and, and like a growth fund was just raised around down rounds specifically. It's something that I happen to see on uh, on Vanessa. Axios or something last week. And and so uh, it's it's wild out there. SVB is uh, was bought by. Is it called First Republic? Sorry, I'm Canadian. I think it's First Citizen. First, First Citizen. Citizen, right? Yeah. Like a bank from North Carolina. And uh, and so, how do you feel? Do you feel uh, uh, you feel like your your stuff that you're doing is risky, or do you feel the same, or do you feel better for some reason than you did before, Kevin? So it depends on. Um, what side of me? So I feel great for, cause our customers love our product and mm -hmm. we're growing like weeds. Yeah. Um, I don't feel great on the investor sentiment and the overall sentiment in like the American economy. Okay. Um, I, I don't, I'm, I'm no economist, so I'm not going to take any like personal viewpoints on that, but just the sentiment is not great. Um, but I could also see like in the next three to six months, everything turning around and this thing start ripping again. Um, the market start ripping again. Um, and just based on, um, a few different factors, um, doesn't, doesn't look like the banks are going to collapse, even though that SVB definitely, as far as like the VC industry, it like put it on pause for at least six months like everybody is like for sure holding out and that is going to destroy companies um yep. and that if it will give you a recap and and maybe andy can explain what actually physically happened because he, he was in finance before but do you want to explain just the, the mechanics of what is svb what happened to them you don't have to take a personal viewpoint on them so uh, for anyone listening out there, what happened? It's an old fashioned bank run. What's a bank run? It used to be everyone would go to the local bank branch, this picture, 1930s pictures, and you'd go ask for your money back and people would fight themselves in line to get their cash back. And once the bank was out of cash, the bank would have to close. Today, how does a bank run work? Well, it's done on apps. It's done on your mobile app. You can wire out from your account. And a bank run can dra drain a well-capitalized bank in, I don't know, 8 to 12 hours, give or take, because of the 40, hell. 44 billion out of uh, SVB or something? Uh, I'm not sure of the exact numbers, but it's, the, it's a mobile bank run. So you can get your money out via the internet, on a mobile device, wherever you are in the world. So, so, how did, so why, did this ha why did this happen? It was from an underlying bad investment that SVB made. Yeah, I, I, they, SVB owned a bunch of mortgage securities and what they basically had is a mismatch, mismatch in duration. So they own mortgages, mortgage-backed security and treasury bills that would be fine if they held them to maturity. But on an interim basis, when interest rates went up, the price of these bonds right. and mortgages went down. And so what you'd have to do is if you want to need redemptions, you have to sell these bonds and mortgages as at a loss. And according to the news that I've read, that's what they had to do. And so once you take a loss for a bank business, you deplete your cash, your book value, your shareholders equity, 
and you have to then go raise equity capital. And my takeaway from this is they actually didn't have a bad balance sheet. Uh, yeah. This is nothing like Lehman Brothers or any of the stories that we heard from 2008. This was just a confluence of bad events. So one, they needed to raise capital. My guess is they were probably slow on raising capital. Two, Twitter is a vicious cycle. And yeah. you saw a rumor mill on tw Twitter. And three, everyone has a mobile app now. And so this didn't exist in 2008. Back then, you couldn't just wire your money out that quickly. And so now you can drain a capital, uh, the, you can drain a bank very quickly. And we saw this with a few other banks, it looks like. It wasn't just SVB. It was Signature Bank in the U.S., which is a New York-based primary real estate lending bank. And First Republic got into a bunch of trouble on their own. All these banks have one thing in common. They all cater to businesses or wealthy individuals. So it's much better to have a deposit base of people all over the U.S. who have $10,000 in their account. It's much right. harder to drain that. But when you have businesses with 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars in your account, you can drain a bank very quickly. And that's what happened. And that's why the primary, uh, the, the banks that have succumbed to this are mostly business focused yeah. or high net worth, worth focused. It's kind of so, wild when you think about it. It really, it, I just did the math for, I guess, the first time in my head. $50 million in an account, which, by the way, I want to emphasize is a lot, but in venture is not as much as it would be out there in the rest of the world. 20 of those businesses, boom, billion dollars, bam, right away. Yeah. Yeah. And if you've been in venture for a while, you know that it is possible. Uh, not easy, but possible. De definitely to not smart to have $50, 50 million. Regardless, um, if you have $50 million, you should have a CFO and, and you should be spreading that across even before this happened. But yes. Regardless, I think um, what we should talk about is some of the ramifications now. So SUV has been purchased. Um, who knows? Like, I think that SVB, and I, I've been publicly a big proponent of SVB. SVB, I've been with them for the past 10 years. I've banked with them both um, with, with us now and my previous business and personally as well. Um, and I've been a big proponent. I think that what they offered startups um, was something very unique. They offered mm -hmm. them. Um, a lot of the different services that some of the other big banks didn't. And they also cater to VCs. Um, and so this is the reason why I, th I think it's really healthy to have a lot of different competition in like the banking world. Like if we just had the big four, they wouldn't offer different services that cater to certain different um, demographics or different businesses. So I think that's why I really did like SVB. But what's happened now and the fallout is that everybody is the the vc industry as well i'd say most finance like most in, in invest i don't know I'm, i'll just talk about the vc industry industry because i know more about that than any of the other, other investment industry industries but it's very you get very skittish and it could go one way or another mm -hmm. very quickly um so it could go um very um uh, bullish as we've seen in 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 2021 um when interest rates are super low and you can see these high markups in public companies then everybody's everybody's investing in everything and then when the potential of bank collapses um are going to happen and they're going to worry about well if i make this investment in this series a company who's going to lead the series b should i even be making series a investments also should i be making series b investments even if it is a really good company and so what that does is is just and what i'm obviously hoping for um for everybody is that it's just going to put a pause but it definitely i would say is put a massive pause for even good companies going out to raise money just from the fallout, even though even though the SVB is back in business, nobody lost any money, but it, but the sentiment out there is still like very conservative and very like yeah. fearful versus yeah. being very optimistic. Um, and, you know, when you used to have teammates, you know, you would. Um, I mean, I remember my last finance, uh, last company, and also at the very beginning of this one, I'm sure Kevin, you felt the same thing, where people are like. I don't know if you express to people, we have this much runway, but I have kind of like always talked about it. And I've said, okay, we were going to go out at this date to raise the next thing or whatever. Yeah. 
and but de definitely like I, just today i was having a one-on-one -on -one with one of my teammates and and uh and and it was like are we going to draw down this debt should we do that because a, a practice has a, a debt line that they got with silicon valley bank canada right which is an entity that's like vaguely associated but not completely commensurate with svb us and so and so one of the things that people are asking themselves is is will the uh the new owner of silicon valley bank will will they they have a relationship with venture capital that is like oh yeah like we'll take care of you if you for example if you don't hit your numbers in 12 months from now on then how how forgiving would svb be traditionally they would be quite forgiving right and yeah. most venture lenders would be quite forgiving they would say it would be oh no big deal like we can figure something out they, there was this relationship with SVB and in New York, it was, I think with square one and some others, they were always really chill about it. And now the question is, is will this new acquirer do the same? And so it's making people like me question whether I should draw down because I'm thinking, what about this new owner, right? Is this new owner trustworthy the way, and, and will they have a relationship with, for example, Andreessen Horowitz, the way that right. SVB has a relationship with Andreessen Horowitz, for example. Yeah, I think it's hard to I think it's hard to say and I think that if you So it's it's been common practice for a lot of a lot of VCs and also founders as soon as you raise around you get um uh uh you go to S if you're bank of SUB, you you go get a um uh a loan, um a venture debt loan. Um it could be up to half of what you raise in equity sometimes. And that was just what you did. And it's always on the promise of let, that you're going to get your next deal. Because how SVB and how most banks make their money is they make money off of the the interest they make in their balance sheet. So SVB wants you to keep, you, they want everybody, including the VCs and the founders, they all want to keep this ecosystem alive. That's how everybody makes money. Banks make money by having balance or by having capital and and. and you're in inside SVB, they make money on the interest. Um, VCs make money on the the exits. Entrepreneurs make money on the exits. So it's this huge huge community that works together very well. Um, I don't know what's going to happen um, with this new bank if they're going to yeah. be as they're going to work as closely with the 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 startups and VCs. Um, th there there may be some changes in that, and I think that like I, I've seen a lot of advice um going around um and i know i don't know if this is like actually true but a lot of people are like i always tell my my um uh portfolio companies never take any debt because debt debt can be really like mm -hmm. it, it can kill a company um but if you if you're already taking venture um that means you're already not profitable um and you always need that next round anyways mm -hmm. so does a little extra debt does it really i think that's the other side of the coin does it really make make a big difference it may give you some extra runway um but debt you have to actually pay back and yeah. if you don't pay it back the the, the the bank can own your actual startup so i think mm -hmm. it definitely a catch 22 i'd say if you don't need if you're profitable and you don't need to take debt then you definitely should not yeah. um but the nature of running a venture back business is that we're not profitable it's um, almost like a new type of risk that it is because back in the day like in 2015, and Andy, I'm super curious about like what happened with iBankers. I'm going to ask you this in a second. Like, what happened with iBankers during Lehman Brothers and in 2008 and other things like this? Like, was there a kind of a systemic pullback in the same way? I'll just say that debt at the time, Breather had gigantic amounts of venture debt that it used on a rotating basis to pay for real expenses, right? Because it had real costs, a uh, cost of goods sold. And so, um, the, that was that was used a great deal, but most software businesses don't really need it. And there was this view of, oh, don't put it on the books. The next investor won't like it. Having had the conversation today already with Andreessen Horowitz and some other people, I would say that each situation is, of course, unique, but that Andreessen is like, if you could draw it, draw it, you know, They're like do it. And the perspective is, is that many companies will have debt on the books in the future and the next financing. So actually like all companies will be equal from that perspective. 
Um, now, Andy, talk to me about like systemically what happened during, I mean, it's a big conversation, but, and you just express how they're different, but what happened after Lehman Brothers? Did iBankers like, did that really, those relationships break down? What happened exactly? How so you, uh, investment banking is a little bit different than what we're talking about here. So investment banking is mainly mergers and acquisitions. So a company wants to be bought or sold, uh, fi financings, but most likely IPOs, uh, and very large credit. Uh, not you wouldn't deal with small, non-profitable venture back companies. You dealt with companies that were very large and generated a lot of EBITDA and free cash flow. Um, in general, any time you have some type of banking crisis, any time you have some type of recession or shock to the system, credit becomes much harder to get. That's a rule. Of, it doesn't matter if yeah. you're a semiconductor company, investment grade credit versus junk bonds versus venture backed companies. But in general, venture backed companies are the riskiest of risky companies. There is no cash flow. And it's been a very specific product that has mainly been historically sold by the banks in Silicon Valley plus debt funds. Uh, and those are the f folks like WTI, Triple Point, some of the hedge funds, et cetera. And so yeah. in yeah. general, if you have a banking crisis, availability of credit is going to go down. The interesting part about this cycle and what happens is how does this actually impact what the Fed is doing, i.e. raising interest rates? Because if you have a banking crisis, if you have loss in consumer confidence, potentially you actually do have inflation going down. And so this could be good for the economy. So it's very interesting to think right. through the first and even second order consequences of what will happen here. And I don't have a great answer. I'm curious is whether this is something that you would feel, it, it, it's almost as if um, if you have a business that in the, in the quote unquote good times, you might have venture debt, it would be at like 3% interest or whatever, prime plus one, but that would be like a 4% interest rate or something like that. And it's actually much more affordable to draw down. Uh, but the result of the, the equity uh, markets being so open and available and so easy to finance the company through the next uh, round results in less debt being drawn down. Whereas ironically here on the opposite side, the equity draw pulls back and the result is that, and, and the debt is actually more onerous to have on the uh, drawn down. So actually most, both sides are more difficult. Right. Uh, how does, how does, uh, I mean, it's a big question of it's like, how, do, how's an entrepreneur supposed to stay alive here? Uh, you know, uh, uh, other than making their, their costs as small as they possibly can, you know, it's, make they're, your they're, revenue big, they're big existential your questions. Costs. Make your revenue higher than your costs. Yeah. Problem solved. But that's the opposite of what venture back companies have done. Right. And so that's why it's, it's a whole ecosystem and everybody needs to play, right? Like the banks need to play that we need mm -hmm. to have the, obviously the entrepreneurs are always going to be here building stuff. Um, the VCs need to play. And so right now you see, do you see a lot of crazy behaviors? Like I posted a tweet um, and I got a lot of activity on it. And, and, and I, I'm, I'm seeing like friends of mine that are just starting out companies that are raising at like seed companies with like no deck at like 60 million post right yet with for seed because what's happening is that a lot of the later later stage firms um they don't want to touch the like the b's and c's because they don't know when that next round is going to come from and they may actually they 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 may even just look at and those those Actually, maybe even a lot of the companies that raise a too high valuation still happen to have product market fit, mm -hmm. everything like that. And also, given the SVB pause, they may just be, or the SVB situation, they may might just be thinking, let's pause now, see what happens in the economy, because those are, those are uh, companies closer to going public. Um, so you have a lot of larger firms coming into the seed where it's like, we don't need to see a lot of traction like for the next few years. And that I think also is not good behavior. Like giving, I've never, I, I can't think of one company that's raised at like a 60 million post up for their seed that actually mm -hmm. has done well. 
It's actually because wild. Like belief it's is such an incredible thing. We like all of us here on this panel, we thrive off of belief and we yes. die when belief stops. And so right. the better you are at providing belief, and of course, belief occurs on a systemic basis as well. It is either high at any given time, like you get the benefit of the doubt of any com funny conversation, for example, that you have, or employee conversation or anything, or it's at lows. And when it's at lows, it's like maybe someone, it would be harder to, to get them to join the business because they believe, you know, it's risky right. to do so. Same thing with a with an investor, same with everything. So it's, uh, it, it's it, and, and the draw, the, the biggest pullback, and I think Kevin, you know this, it's at your stage, the Series B stage. Yeah. In in almost all cases, I think Thomas Tungas or whatever from Redpoint talked about how the number of dollars going into companies is equal, but the actual number of deals is is gone down by something like twenty five or thirty or some number percent percent, whereas they've only gone down ten or twenty at the seed or at the A. Right. So you're actually the most affected, and beyond you. There's a breakout trajectory, which you might argue, of course, that you were already on, right? right. But uh, but beyond you, there's a breakout trajectory, and the winners are already chosen, so it's <laughs> like it's financeable again, right? Yeah, it's um, and and then you also have kind of the Walking Dead companies that um, that are are just not finan financeable as well, and that's where you you may see. I don't know if we want to bring up the cram down rounds or or something like that, um, kind of applicable too. So you either have the companies that raise at like one to 200 X the revenue that are just like, right. they're, they're not, they're probably not running on capital because they have a ton of capital, but it's like, do you give back money? Like, are you like, you don't have product market fit. You raise it way too much, big of a valuation. Yeah. What are you going to do? You're just going to, you're just walking. I dead. mean, it's a, it's a great question. So regarding the cram down rounds, I think Andy knows about them and I know about them because I've been part of them. And so, so what, what will happen because the only the other thing that's happening is is that these companies have gigantic pref stacks, okay? Yes. And and so a company like yours that is I, I think quite honorably um, uh, raised conservatively at every financing, you've been on the record saying that you want eighteen months of of funding each time you do it, and actually yeah. no more, for example. And I know you you try to keep your burn as low as possible. Your company's profitable, I think, at this point. So not profitable, no. But close to profitable, cash flow no, positive. Which yeah, is cash flow positive. Excuse yeah. me, that's what I meant. Yeah. yeah. So, so then uh, you you keep your, your pref stack small, but then you had companies in these in the WeWork Uber days, and even right up to twenty twenty two, like have three companies, all of a sudden they have a fifty million dollar pref stack with no product market fit. Right. So, so what? So what do investors do? And Andy, Andy has my understanding is he's familiar with these. He's never been in a company that has done them. I have been in, on the board of a company that has done one. And so I've actually seen what happens when this occurs. And, and it's it, someone wants to finance the company and they're interested in it, but they no longer believe, A, that the pref stack is going to be paid back or B, um, they're just like the valuation is just not, it is too high or both. Right. And and so they do one of these cram down rounds that Good Eggs did or some other and that are increasingly going to become um, uh, uh, common, com more common and talked about yes. in the next couple of years versus before where it was like kind of not discussed. Right. And and so the prep stack essentially goes to as close to zero as possible by producing a pay to play mechanism where your yep. equity is wiped out or converted. If you do not participate in the round and all of a sudden a bunch of investors go, oh shit. Yep. Andy, uh, what, what is, uh, where have, not where have you seen this necessarily, unless you want to talk about it, but like, talk to me about like what you have noticed during financing like this when you were in venture. So I, I, I'll caveat, I've never been on the side of receiving one of these. But when I was an associate in venture in 2009 to 2011, I did some of these. Um, I worked at a firm that chose to really save companies versus just writing them off. And I have seen these done a few times. Um, it typically involves restructuring the entire company. There was a lot of work involved for the VC. 
they have to want to roll up their hands and get dirty. It's typically a scenario where one VC has a lot of capital invested. And most, and most of the time, it's more of a scenario where the VC acts like an operator versus a financial investor. Because this is a lot of work. Mm. And most of the time, if not done well, these will just, it's good money after bad. Where I've seen it work very well right. is people have a lot of capital in deals, say $30, $40 million in an earlier stage company. The company is performing well. They are just struggling to fundraise. They have some funds on the cap table that don't want to participate and so on and so forth. And it's a very difficult conversation with the team. And I've seen successful companies go through this and then successfully exit. But it's, it's, it's work to get this to, to do this. Um, and, and everybody is unhappy when it happens. It depends. Um, I don't think everyone's unhappy when it happens. I think typically management teams will be incentivized to participate. I think other yep. smaller investors may be unhappy. And the existing employees, existing employees, unfortunately, get wiped out. Yeah, but you can incentivize uh, that. I mean, they'll That's reprice fine. the options. Yeah, it's it's really it's really the pref that that are going to get damaged by that. It screws over the degree. little investors. Yeah, the little investors yep. who are capped out, for example, and who can't put in whatever amount of money it is to protect their existing pref stack slash ownership, and so. You know, like angel investors, for example, completely wiped out. But the other, the other thing is, is it forces people on or <laughs> off the table. And so right. Bill Gurley, you know, he's on the board of this company, Good Eggs, and they, they are not participating in this right. cram down round. And the result is, I don't know the exact mechanism in this case, but that their ownership effectively goes to zero yep. and that their pref stack becomes one tenth or something of what it used it instantly, which is crazy. Andy is right. It requires investors who still believe what, what the money just isn't there. Well, and, and also pro probably I don't I don't know who led this round. A lot of VCs are 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 as as we kind of mentioned in the beginning of the show. It's it's very much a community. So there's they co invest in all these other deals and everything. And so you're going to come in and you're going to basically be like I'm I'm going to come in and basically make your equity worth nothing. And even even though that they are. They are essentially saving the company because likely the other option were to go to business. It's really hard for some people that are, are, are have a close relationship with these other investors to come in and do that. Mm -hmm. And that's where I, where I think that a lot of companies, um, they don't have the option to do this. But you also can make the, the case where if the company was in the, this position, um, it most likely wouldn't have had a venture like outcome yeah. anyways. Um, so that's why I think a lot of investors also don't like doing this. Um, but yeah, and he, and he's had a, a good quote there. Yeah. It's, it's never good to, to chase, um, uh, good money after bad. Meaning like if you did make a bad investment, um, like you would still have dollars, you should go and put it into the, the, the uh, players that are actually doing well. I think we're in a really interesting environment now because we ha just have, this kind of pause in in a lot of like like the series a and series b rounds mm -hmm. with vcs just trying to wait to see what's going to happen and I'll, it could have caught a lot of companies off guard as far as the timing of their fundraising and then you just have especially if you're earlier stage like a series a or company or series b company likely is not going to get a cram down it's going to be probably a later stage company right. probably going to be somebody coming in that does not work that closely with with series a and series b investors and it's just looking for a good financial outcome so like good eggs like they're essentially like a grocery store so i mean i don't know who came in and did this but like you could definitely see an, a non-vc type investor coming in and just wanting to to kind of own a lot of this uh, but that's kind of like some of the, the what, what what's happening but you keep on hearing there's going to be more of this i I really can't see it, honestly, on like the Series A and Series B rounds happening mm -hmm. that much yeah. because it's just too hard to get done. But, you um, know, it, it really does speak, Kevin, to this idea of um, like, you know, years one through four or something of a, yeah. of a company, of a venture back company, are actually like the chillest 
<laughs> they are simplest the chillest. rounds and simplest years. It's just like, huh, you know, let's make something. And then the customers are unhappy, but then all of a sudden they're happy. And right. they're like, oh my God, this is, I've been waiting for this for years. They say, <laughs> I think that was the right way. But like all of the incentives are aligned. Right? Yep. And it's just like years five, year six, year seven. Andy, I don't know how many years Nana is in, but I know it's a meaningful number of them. It's like the structures get complicated. Inevitably, somewhere, some round is difficult, and maybe it created a structure on a financing. Now it's like, okay, so maybe the, the founder in year one through four is good, but like, is he still, or he or she, are they still good in year seven or eight? Not really as clear. So to go the distance, it's that 10-year arc, is actually like insane. And for That's things why it's to go so right, impressive when you see people, that, especially that have went through times like this. Like if you go through a time and you have just a company that's done relatively well and you haven't had any crises like we're going through right now and you see them going through that 10-year journey, like, mm -hmm. like that, that, that's relatively easier. But like going through something like this, even if you are a good company, like it's, this is going to impact every single company. Well, that's what it, that's why it impresses me so much. And and I and I say this to you. I've always I've always felt that maybe you have a certain risk tolerance that I don't have or something. But for like, me, yes, you. Yeah, because because I, I you're literally like I only raised eighteen months of capital. It's like, dude, how the you don't know what's going to fucking happen in eighteen months. <laughs> and and so and not only that, but you don't even, you know, like like I said, and like we we raised eight during that round with Andreessen and 2 million before. So we've got 10 million in ish, but like I had way more on the table. Should I have taken 10? 100% you should have. I, I didn't. I should have taken it, right? No. I did, yes. But like no. maybe you I should have. Right. And, no. and meanwhile, so Kevin, I'm going to, I'm going to express your attitude back to you and then you can, you can correct me. Yes. It's just like, fuck it. You're going to figure it out. And yeah. the pressure will cause you to operate better than you would be with that cushion. Is that right? Totally. Yeah. That's the thing. Like when you are, when you go through times like this, like, so, and it goes, and, and maybe I definitely rotate a little, a little too far to the one side, but like I was, my last company, like we went completely the other opposite direction. Mm -hmm. Like we, we raised at, on negative gross margins at like, like if you compare it to the money people raised 2022 that we would have been valued at like a billion dollars or something like that off of like a million dollars in revenue like that's how crazy the our, our rounds were and so and then i just see like the bad behaviors that happen within companies like when you have a lot of money um you just mask problems with money and when you don't have a lot of money agree it it it, it is very uncomfortable and that may mean you have to do things like do potentially do some layoffs, do some restructuring of the team. You have to say no to a lot of stuff, um, but it, it really just focuses you and then it gives you more optionality. So you don't have this high prep stack. You don't have this huge valuation. Mm -hmm. yep. So in times like these, you have a little bit more optionality than the people who have raised at the 100x um, and that have so, so, so much of a huge prep stack, there's just no way that they can get additional capital. And there's also no way that they could become profitable either. So mm -hmm. they're just going to go out of business. Yeah. And also they haven't found product market fit because they've been using all the capital yeah. to just hire all of these senior execs. So I definitely operate in a way it's like raise the money you need to for each stage. But even during times like this, it does, it, it makes it, I mean, I'm not going to lie to you, like, where like we're, with the, the choices that, that we have to make right now, like we're in a we're really good position versus mm -hmm. a lot of other companies. Um, but like, we're not like fl flushed with capital and never sure. we're hiring right. a shitload of people and all of the things that I love to do. Yeah. But I think with, with less people relative to your stage, it just, it creates these constraints that you, you, mm -hmm. you, you and, then, and then you still have enough options that you are able to, figure out a way at a path, a path around everything. Mm -hmm. Someone, some executive coach or CEO somewhere said something like, you know, the quality of the CEO is effectively their ability to make hard decisions. Mm -hmm. You are saying, and I, Andy, I, I feel like you've got a thought here. It's, it's, uh, you're saying 
force yourself to make those hard decisions by having no cash. I respect that. It it is it is I you know I'm I'm not soft anymore. You know I've got scar tissue. Uh, but I uh, but and so I I respect the way that you're thinking about it, Andy. Hmm. What what? So mind? where I was going with this is I have a mentor and someone I used to work with. He's a very successful entrepreneur. He started multiple companies, sold them for multiple three hundred fifty million dollar plus exit. And he always drilled into me that companies go out of business for one reason: you run out of money. And basically, the genesis of this information hmm. of this advice is. If you can raise money, you will figure it out and figure it as a good operator. That is so wrong. But no, that Kevin. So, so And so many different. So, but that no, no. apparently assumes you're a great operator. Wait, well, wait was this Will at RRE? Be, at not, because we, Will said, said this to me over at dinner. And maybe he got it from the same He didn't. It was like a New York operator. Sem- yeah. It's a the West Coast individual. Very well thought of. And it's true. It mostly is true. The problem is, it's not no, true. it is. The problem is with this and why it's not true is most people aren't good operators. <laughs> and most people who were able to raise money over the past few years, by def- it just put together a PowerPoint presentation, have never run a P&L, have never looked at numbers, have never understood what it takes to make a business work. And so if you raise $15 million and treat it like, okay, we can go to the Bahamas now for a three week team offsite. Yeah, there are some perverse incentives here. But for a great operator, if you give them the right amount of capital, they're going to shine time and time again and we'll figure it out. And maybe you'll see them pivot sure. three or four times. The problem in this advice, most people just aren't great operators. Mm-hmm. Most people okay, are let slow. Ask, let me ask a question. I, what I want to, what I want to know. Andy, is inherent in your thesis, it seems like, and it seems like the venture of you, maybe it'll be different later, is like, for example, like, did I need 10 million to get to where I am? I didn't use all of it, but like, did, did I need that to get to my next stage? No, strictly speaking, I probably could have financed it less, but that the buffer allows for a certain amount of creativity and effectiveness should the operator be of a sufficient quality. And so it's worth financing and giving the extra cash and given the extra valuation, which is why Second Time Founders, the name of this podcast, um, command the premium. Is that essentially? Yeah, it? it's, you will find product market fit. You will pivot. You will find your way into it. I don't agree with that. Okay. I mean, you don't have to. Um, I, I've seen it happen and time and time again. The problem is most of the time that people get these $50 million rounds, they're actually hype companies. And they're interesting space, young team, and maybe they don't figure it out. Not to say that young teams are bad. I think young teams are incredible. But by definition, this is a lot of gritty work. 90% of startups fail. So we're talking about of the 10% that are successful. And I think what everyone forgot over the last couple of years and with 0% interest rates was this There was a red point study in 2012, I believe, or maybe it was 2011, where they calculated that there were only 10 deals worth doing in venture in a year. And it was your job as the venture capitalist to do to find one to two of those 10. Now, all of a sudden, the industry is expanded, I don't know, 50 times over. Yes, Yes. And so everyone is looking for a quote unquote unicorn. And I don't mean that by a billion dollar valuation company. I mean that as one of those 10 deals. And yeah, there's been some platform shifts. So maybe now there are 25 great companies a year. But that's what produces venture outcomes. And so yes, if you give me a great operator who's made money time and time again, and they come in and they ask for $50 million, I would give it to them every day of the week. Okay, I I think the so I think that um, the the great operator you're talking about is like one in a th- a thousand entrepreneurs. It's me. The starts. great operator is me. And and, and the great operator is and, and 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 the reason why I just like vehemently disagree with you, and also from the VC side of things, it makes sense. Like, what can they control? They find a good operator. What can they do? The only thing they can do is they give give them capital, but what happens when even really good operators, when they're given a lot of capital, 
it just it allows them to think in longer time horizons. It allows them to just hire more senior people because you don't have to do the gritty shit. Like, I understand the operator you're talking about, Andy, that's willing to keep the team small and just grind it out. And like, they're talking to customers and all that. And like, do those people exist? Sure. But like, that is like 0.00001% of, of, of people who start venture back companies. If you could find them, Sure. But also, I know a lot of other people that have created public companies that they've gone to to go and create other companies and taken that $50 million and flush it down the fucking toilet. So because they they have like the, the incentives just aren't totally aligned and the time, the time scale as well. And that's why it makes sense for, in my opinion, this is why I think you, you see a lot of V is like what can VCs really? What do they? Have? They have they have capital, right? They have they have to find that the right founders and they have capital to deploy them. I think they they um they 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 just think that they could fix a lot of them do and and I think their incentive is is that they they just can find that great operator or look for the pedigree of the team too. So I I, I hate when I see these these teams getting funded that are X Stripe and X whoever of of that they had a, a a small part in like creating their success and they're given these like massive terms and they've never actually run a business before um but it, it's I don't, I don't know i'm kind of rambling on but i just it, I, yeah. i've eaten i really do not like the mm -hmm. idea that a, a a great operator can always create product market fit with enough capital there's something that i want you to think about kevin as we pass to andy for a second it's it, i suspect and think it through I suspect that there's because because your last company it, it's it's known. I, I it turns out I actually screenshotted the tweet where you're talking where the account talked about ship shutting down. I remember it, right? And it was a defining moment in my life. You were my idol, not quite, but but <laughs> you know, but Thank you. your company had a big effect on a lot of people, and and so that that spectacular up and down, yeah, had an effect on your thinking. Whereas it's. When when someone has been to a certain stage and they're like, "Fuck! If I only I could get another two million, I think we could get there," and they can't get it, that it's that that has an effect of saying, "Fuck! We were almost there. If only we had taken a couple more million bucks." Now we're passing to Andy. He has been waiting a while. Go. So I, I think at first there's so much to unpack for what Kevin said. So <laughs> first, I mean, a great operator. Uh, takes a company public the first time and we assume he's a great operator. They may not be a great operator. There's a lot of, the one thing sure. about life that's very interesting, that's very hard to deduce is luck versus skill. And so I think you yep. can look at people who took companies public the last five years, people made a lot of money in venture the last five years. Was that a luck event or a skill event? And there's a whole thesis and this is a whole class that it, in, manage, in management science where we can go through and talk about luck versus skill. And there's some great books written about this. Second, pedigree a team. Pedigree a team is not equal to a great operator. Pedigree of team, why people like pedigree of team is because if the team is really good, there is a good shot and they have pedigree, there's a good shot they'll be able to attract and hire other good people. It's not that they themselves are really good. It's just they'll know through their network, maybe they can hire great engineers they used to work with versus when you find someone who has no pedigree, there's a lot more hustle involved to build that team out. You have a lot, you get to skip skips if, steps if you have a great designer that you're really close with, a great staff engineer you're really close with, and maybe a great salesperson that you're really cl close with versus somebody else who's coming out of college and going to go find them on LinkedIn or through their or through word of mouth. So that's the reason that people like pedigree. But pedigree doesn't correlate to great offer. So that that's just my retort no. and where I come back with on this. I agree. I com I completely agree with that. So yeah. what does correlate to being a great offer? Typically it's proven skill. Well, I, I think I think that's what what all VCs are looking for, right? How do you actually prove, like, you could look at this, what somebody's done before? Um, you like that could be maybe a failed startup. I think that um, a lot there's a lot of great operators um, 
and entrepreneurs that are coming from failed startups, um, they definitely have something to prove. Um, you, you can look for people that have been from zero to IPO, especially I think like in the B2B world where a lot of the, the kind of go to market and everything, those are all reproducible and you just can go and pick a market. I've, I've seen this happen a lot before. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's another way to, to go about it. But I think that's, that's the, that's the whole thing. Like it's, it's really unknown, like who actually is going to be a great entrepreneur and operator. That's kind of the um, magic of this space a little bit. That's the whole magic. If, if, yeah. if, if any three of us knew we, and we just raised the fund, we would, we would all be rich. So, um, that, that's, that's kind of the name of the and game. I, I but... will say, I will say this, that just in general, there is this. There, I don't think that I'm just treading water here, but like there is, there is a such an advantage to just being in the venture back tech space, just because so much is going on at any given time. So yeah. you could just be treading water where other people are like in the surfing lineup, and and you're just gonna get picked up by something, right? Right? Like, and that's just kind of amazing. It's it's. As a result of being an executive coach to a few CEOs, I have done deals that I have been so proud of doing, and I'm looking at this business growing so quickly, oh my God. And I've known entrepreneurs that I've met at like offsites. And the result of that is some connection to an investor five years down the line or, or some uh, operator that I met as a result of it. It's like just being in this space it's uh, it's uh, I, I've never seen this movie, so I'm kind of like misquoting it, but it's like plastics. You got to be in plastics because it's the future. That's the way I feel about tech. It's just like there's so much happening, that even though you might be unlucky and you might miss this one and you might miss the next one. You might miss the one after that. It's just like at some point. Oh, a yeah. Wave is going to hit you. You just got to stay. You just got to stay in the arena, right? You, you can't. Yep. You can't get out. And then eventually. Yeah, you may be unlucky that there's going to be a lot of companies um, right now that are going to be unlucky. Um, and uh, maybe they could have survived in the 0% interest uh, world. Um, I, w I really do wonder, like, of some of the companies that even IPO, like, how many of them could have survived something like this? Well, I mean, uh, definitely all the Blue Aprons and all the others, right? So when you think of a number of them, uh, these uh, direct to consumer companies, these, uh, you know, not not quite surviving off of paid um, uh, customer acquisition, like like the Blue Aprons, all these businesses, yeah, that fundamentally just didn't either didn't have network effects or just an increasing cost of acquisition with a dependence on a single channel type of thing, like right. you, you like money is just expensive now, so you should use it well as right. opposed to use it frivolously. I didn't know how to do that in the last business. Lots of businesses uh, that were selling, not to disrespect anyone, but mattresses, you know, or whatever. Like it, it, it just ain't that, ain't that easy anymore. Yeah, and I th and I think that's where like I, I for me um, going through my last company has has definitely taught me a lot of things. And it's like, first of all, it's like get to product market fit as, as fast as you can. Like, I, I, I think that's what everybody listening here, like once you, once you have that and hopefully you've done that with the, with a pretty slim team, then mm -hmm. you just, that doesn't mean you're going to make it ultimately. Um, but the, your options are going to be a lot higher, a, a lot, a, a lot more increased than somebody who has just chased, uh, raising larger rounds or, or, or building bigger teams. And that's something that I've done from day one um, here at Air House. And um, we potentially could have gone faster, raised more money. Um, maybe we could have like um, got to, we could have been like 10 times the size by now, but I, I took the learnings of like going through those hard times and trying to apply them. I yeah. think that's another, another thing, like as, as you, Julie, you talk about us just, just being in venture, like, I think you need to also take all the learnings that that are that that you're you're going through. So like right now, the learnings that people should be taking from this is like don't be as reliant on VC um, as as uh, uh, companies in the past have been. 
um like i look at a lot of these these walking dead companies that are just like they may have had a, had a great product but like they raised way too much money they don't have uh probably product market fit or they may not be able to to raise more capital they're not profitable um they're just probably dead um and they could have had a great team amazing team so i think that's like one big learning that hopefully people take out of this another is is ma- make sure that you you uh, understand that there's a two hundred fifty fifty thousand dollar um, FDIC insurance limit on a bank account, <laughs> right. um, and uh, you properly understand how sweep works to sweeps work into money market accounts and all of those different things. Um, but I, I think I think it goes back to like what my core, but like even going through this, um, and we have a great company. It's just like focus on your customer. Do with this like slim as team yeah. as you can and then i still I'll, I'll push back on both of you like raise as little as as you can to prove out your I different mean, milestones it, it is causing me to be creative i will definitely say that i i believe that i would have hired more people that i probably did not need right part of me does want it but that i that me not doing it is probably a, a good constraint I, andy i was going to ask you since i know you're closer on the venture side like what do you think is happening to all these scout funds and these little micro funds that these randos have? Not the ones that took off, right? The ones where they got to a meaningful amount of capital, maybe even on angel list, and let's say they make it to fund two or fund three or whatever. But what's like all these all these scouts, like what's happening to these people and all these like micro funds? Are they just getting wiped out and those people are gonna start an well, what do, what do I think happens with those micro funds? I think they're in a lot of trouble. I think they have trouble raising fund two, fund three, fund four. I think the dirty little secret is everyone want it, wants institutional investors. And unless you have institutional investors, if you're relying on entrepreneurs or wealthy people to kind of fill out your fund, you're going to have trouble. It's not right. just the micro funds. You'll see the $150 million venture funds that are going to have issues raising. Um, There's no doubt. Yeah. Scout funds, I think, are a different animal. Uh, those are focused on driving basically deal flow for the parent VC. And so I think yep. those will exist and have no impact whatsoever. Uh, but your micro funds, your, I mean, everyone we know is a venture capitalist right now, right? I mean, it, 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 mm-hmm. everyone you know in the tech space has some kind of micro fund and some will survive and some won't. And we'll see who is an actual good investor now instead of who is good at playing the hype train. Can we can we end this segment? I know we're getting um, low on time here. With like everybody's learning learnings that they've they've taken um, going through this, um, call it I don't know the last like kind of interest rates going up and SVB um, collapsing. Uh, yeah, it's a good it's a good way to end the episode. The uh, here's I will say this is. Um, the last time that I ran a business in the seed in a type of stage, there was this assumption of, oh, we can hire to solve, right? Mm-hmm. I definitely thought that. I remember thinking that. And I was not good at saying no. And I gave people that were actually inexperienced operators at the time the benefit of doubt. Oh, you say you need to hire someone? Sure. Like, fuck it. Right. Um, I am a little bit, I'm, I'm meaningfully more Dr. No today, right? Right. Uh, one is, is, is I have more experience than not only than some of the people that I work with, but way more experience than I did last time. So that's an element of it is uh, become Dr. No faster. And I think that you end up being able to get better operation of your business out of it. Don't force yourself to hire the five more people because other people wanted you to right. and then cut down right? Always keep as tight as you can. So that is certainly one of the biggest lessons. I'm extremely happy that I have a tight, a, a, a tight burn relative to what other companies I know. Have. Right. Right. Andy, what do you, yeah. I'll take this one. So I think last five, eight years were kind of a reinvention of the laws of gravity. And when I started my <laughs> career at Lehman, uh, we learned some very interesting lessons in 2008 when we went bankrupt. When I did venture in 2009 to 2011, learned a lot of interesting lessons. And for me, these were always negative lessons that we were able to learn. And 2014 to 
maybe 2017 to 2021 was the exact opposite lesson. And I think the reality is, is we've just reverted to the mean and everything reverts to the mean. And that's where we are today. We may have overcorrected a bit, but it is mean reversion. Yeah. And that's all it really is. And yeah, we'll normalize somewhere in a year or two. But right now we've overcorrected. And this right. is, like, I mean, the basis for the efficient market uh, hypothesis. Our market's perfectly ineff- efficient. And I would argue no. For Kevin, what about you? I'd say that, that um, uh, doing better scenario planning. Um, so like I had a lot of other people that predicted a lot of what's happening today. And I think that we did a fairly good job of navigating it. But I think looking back at it, I could have done some like upfront scenario planning. Of if this happens then go and do this and let, then really pull the trigger on it versus being more reactive. Um, and so that's, that's what I'm going and, and also, and also just listening to, and not, not just thinking that, that all of these people are just crazy and these things will never happen because no, that the economy is just fine and everything like really like look, look at like, there was certain markers and there were certain smart people either on Twitter or even my, my, other, my, my friends were like, you gotta be careful here. Like shit's maybe not going to go so well. And and for me, kind of my my learning from my last company set us up, and I think in a, in a much better, better position. But I think that scenario planning, even more so, and and maybe listening to some of those folks, and and taking it even more cautious, I think that we could have been in a b- bit better position. But I'm still happy where we are today, um, um, especially versus other companies. But it's it's going to be. Um, tough to get out of that, out of the, all these companies to get out of this. And there's going to be so yeah. many, so many people. And, and I hope, I hope the good companies stick around, but some of them maybe mismanage and they won't. And um, that's going to be terrible. But I think, yeah, I definitely would, would, would I don't know. Are, are you guys big on scenario planning? Are you guys, <laughs> are you guys big on scenario planning? Uh, are we doing scenario planning? I, there's not a lot of scenarios in where I'm at, right? It's uh, it definitely, we do look, we, we do have a growth model and we do look at the business and say, where are we going to, where do we believe we're going to get to and what time frame and what the results of that are. Someone, one of my investors recently asked me, do you have product market value? I was like, yes, I believe that I do. And, uh, but without a really clear distribution channel. So uh-huh. to me, it's, uh, there's a linear path and there's sort of an upward path, but there's not much of a it's funny to say, but not much of a slower than this path, right? Like, and so, right. um, I think the business uh, doesn't quite yet need it, right? But in a year, I could see how scenario planning would have been really helpful. I couldn't have tighter of a team than this either. I think I think it would be really tough to do that. Right. Well, let's end it here. Do you guys too? Okay, let's end it. Thanks everybody for listening. Good chatting. Bye-bye. See you later. Bye. Hey, yeah, we keep it real and we bring you the facts. It's the second time founders podcast. Talking tech news. The show is a must. Not some billionaire trying to sell you their book. We're coming from a real place. Plenty ups and downs. Got some insights. Join the discussion now. We being honest and raw. Giving you real talk. We've been at the bottom and made it happen and much more. The second time founders podcast. More building, less talk.